March 1, 1950. President Truman's coffee goes cold as he reads a confession that shatters America's greatest secret. Six months ago, the Soviets detonated their atomic bomb, years ahead of schedule. But the paper trembling in his hands reveals something worse. The bomb wasn't stolen by a Soviet spy. It was handed over by one of our own scientists, a man who ate lunch with Oppenheimer while memorizing his equations, who helped design Fat Man, then drew its blueprints for Stalin. The walls of the Oval Office seem to shrink. In that suffocating moment, Truman whispers one name, Klaus Fuchs. But how does a refugee physicist fleeing Hitler become Stalin's most valuable asset? And why would he betray the very people who saved his life? September 23rd, 1949. Truman's announcement hits America like a hammer. The Soviet Union has the atomic bomb. Imagine yourself hearing this news on your radio. You'd assumed America had a decade-long head start. But you are wrong. Dead wrong. Only four years after Hiroshima, the nuclear monopoly is gone. Panic spreads faster than fallout. But in the shadows of London and Washington, intelligence agencies are asking different questions. How did Stalin's scientists solve problems that took America's best minds years to crack? Could there be a mole? Here's where it gets interesting. A top secret American code-breaking program called Venona has been quietly decrypting Soviet cables since 1943 and they just found something that scared every single one. Buried in the static, there are messages about an insider from Los Alamos, someone codenamed R-E-S-T, who leaked atomic secrets directly to Moscow. One cable even mentions specific dates, specific meetings, specific formulas. The investigators don't know Rest's real name yet, but they know he exists. They know he walked among the Manhattan Project scientists. They know he memorized their work, the pieces align like uranium atoms approaching critical mass. Someone handed Stalin the blueprint for Armageddon. But who would commit such unthinkable treason? And more importantly, why? London, 1941. The Luftwaffe turns the city into an inferno. In a cramped flat, a 30-year-old German refugee hunches over quantum mechanics equations. Meet Klaus Fuchs. Eight years ago, Nazi brown shirts knocked out his front teeth for speaking against Hitler. His mother killed herself after Gestapo harassment and his sister followed. His father, a Lutheran pastor who dared oppose the Fuhrer, rotted in Nazi prison. Young Klaus watched his entire world burn. Can you imagine that rage, that grief? Hitler destroyed everything Fuchs loved. So he escaped to Britain with one goal, fight back with the deadliest weapon he possessed, his brilliant mind. By 1941, Britain desperately needs that mind. Their atomic bomb project, Tube Alloys, is hemorrhaging talent. Rudolf Peierls recruits Fuchs immediately. The quiet German proves invaluable, a theoretical genius with a photographic memory. Colleagues describe him as soft-spoken, polite, invisible. Nobody suspects this man carries a conviction that will doom them all. See, Fuchs isn't just fighting for Britain. When Hitler invades the Soviet Union in June 1941, something clicks in Fuchs's head. The USSR is now dying by the millions to stop the Nazis. 27 million Soviets will perish in this war. Yet Churchill and Roosevelt secretly agree to exclude Stalin from atomic research. To Fuchs, that's not just betrayal. It's a recipe for tyranny. Knowledge of atomic research should not be the private property of any one country. That's what Fuchs tells a communist contact in late 1941. Think about that statement. Really think about it. If one nation monopolizes the bomb, what stops them from enslaving the world? So Fuchs makes a choice that will make history. He contacts Jurgen Kuczynski, leader of Britain's underground communist network. Through him, Fuchs volunteers to spy for the Soviet Union, while the USSR is technically Britain's ally. But he doesn't want money. He doesn't want fame. He wants balance. A world where no single country can threaten nuclear annihilation. Noble goal or the delusion of a traitor. In 1942, he begins feeding atomic secrets to a Soviet agent with a name straight from a spy novel, Ursula Kuczynski. 
codename Agent Sonya. By day, Fuchs helps the Allies build humanity's deadliest weapon. By night, he copies those same blueprints for Stalin. 570 pages of British atomic research flow through his hands to Moscow by 1943. Reactor designs, uranium enrichment, critical mass calculations. But that's just the beginning. Because in 1943, something happens that gives Fuchs access to the biggest secret on Earth. The Quebec Agreement merges British and American atomic programs. Fuchs gets shipped to New York, then Columbia University. He's now inside the Manhattan Project itself. You know where this is heading, don't you? As Fuchs boards a train bound for a dusty laboratory in New Mexico, he carries the hopes of the free world in his briefcase and the determination to steal them. But first, he needs to reach the most secret place in America. How does a communist spy infiltrate Los Alamos? And what happens when he gets there? Los Alamos, New Mexico, 1945. The world's smartest humans racing to split atoms behind barbed wire. Klaus Fuchs arrives in August 1944, assigned to the theoretical division under Hans Beth and Edward Teller. His job? Calculate how to compress plutonium into supercritical mass, the heart of the implosion bomb. Fuchs doesn't just excel, he becomes indispensable. Beth calls him one of the most valuable men in my division. He literally designs components of Fat Man, the bomb that will be dropped on Nagasaki. His colleagues trust him completely. That trust is about to cost America everything. Unknown to everyone, Fuchs has a new Soviet handler on American soil. Harry Gold, codename Raymond, looks like your neighborhood pharmacist. Short, pudgy, forgettable, perfect for espionage. It's the spring of 1945 and the first bomb nears completion. They arrange a meeting that will echo through history. In a religious mission church in Santa Fe, in the dark of the night, a battered blue Buick pulls up to the churchyard. Fuchs at the wheel. Gold slips into the passenger seat. They drive into the New Mexico night, making small talk like old friends. But feel the tension in that car. Both men know they're committing treason with every mile. They park on a ridge overlooking Santa Fe's lights. After an hour of careful conversation, Fuchs reaches into the back seat. His hands shake slightly as he lifts a thick envelope. Inside that package, detailed blueprints for the Fat Man plutonium bomb, the actual design. Gold's pupils dilate. He's holding the power to end cities. They shake hands and vanish into the darkness, knowing they might never meet again. But Gold's journey is just beginning. He takes a bus to Albuquerque, then a plane to Kansas City, and finally a train toward New York. For two weeks, he clutches those papers like his life depends on it, because it does. Every stranger could be FBI. Every bump could mean capture. He buries himself in Dickens's great expectations, but can't focus. How could he? July 16, 1945, Trinity. Klaus Fuchs stands in the New Mexico desert at 5.29 a.m. The countdown hits zero. Flash. The first nuclear fireball turns night into day. The shockwave hits Fuchs like a physical slap. He watches that mushroom cloud rise, orange, purple, apocalyptic, knowing he helped calculate its fury. His American colleagues cheer and weep. Some quote Hindu scripture. Fuchs stays silent. Why? because he's the only one who knows this power already belongs to Stalin. Between 1944 and 1945, Fuchs feeds the Soviets everything. Gaseous diffusion for uranium enrichment, chain reaction mathematics, reactor blueprints, and most critically, the complete implosion design for plutonium bombs. He even leaks American theories about the super, the hydrogen bomb that doesn't exist yet. Everything from Los Alamos straight to Moscow. This was crazy. Armed guards patrol Los Alamos 24-7. Mail is censored. Every scientist is watched. Yet Fuchs operates freely, copying documents by hand in his room, memorizing equations like a human computer. Each package he passes shrinks America's atomic advantage by months, maybe years. By August 1945, when Japan surrenders, Klaus Fuchs has already given Stalin the recipe for Armageddon. But here's what'll really blow your mind. He's just getting started. 
What happens when the war ends and Fuchs returns to Britain? How long can a spy this ambitious stay hidden? Summer 1949, London. Four years of peace, but war's secrets refuse to stay buried. At MY5 headquarters, a file marked V-E-N-O-N-A lands like a bomb on senior investigators' desks. The Americans have shared their most explosive discovery yet. Decoded Soviet cables detail meetings between their agents and a British scientist codenamed R-E-S-T. The messages describe Manhattan Project data flowing to Moscow. Another codename surfaces, Charles, linked to the same source. Every detail points to one conclusion. A British mole operated at Los Alamos, and he might still be active. MI5 starts connecting dots. Rest was in America in 1944. Rest had top-level access. Rest knew implosion physics. They compile a list of British scientists at Los Alamos. One name rises like cream. Klaus Fuchs, a naturalized British citizen with the perfect timing and complete access. And something else. Old MI5 files from 1940 label him a possible communist sympathizer. Back then, Britain needed his genius more than they feared his politics. Now those dusty reports read like warnings they ignored. But here's the problem. Venona evidence is ultra classified. They can't reveal they've cracked Soviet codes. They need a confession. Here is where Jim Scarden appears, MI5's best interrogator, the man who can make stones talk. December 1949, Scarden invites Fuchs for a routine security review. Fuchs walks into that nondescript London office thinking he's helping protect secrets, not suspecting he's about to be cornered about leaking them. Scarden pours tea, discusses the weather, eases into questions about Los Alamos. He watches Fuchs's micro-expressions, the way his fingers tap when certain names are mentioned. The first meeting is inconclusive. Fuchs gives nothing away. But MI5 has time. They call him back, again and again. Each session, Scarden tightens the psychological noose. He drops hints about a spy at Los Alamos, mentions dates that make Fuchs's eye twitch. By the fourth meeting, the brilliant physicist knows they're closing in. January 24, 1950. This time, Scarden shows his cards. Maybe he mentions a specific meeting only Rest would know, or a formula that was never officially shared. Watch Fuchs's facade crack like ice under pressure. He asks to think about things, goes home knowing the game is up. Can you imagine that night? Seven years of perfect deception getting discovered. The next morning, January 27, 1950, Klaus Fuchs returns to the interrogation room. Pale, resolved, he looks Scarden directly in the eye. I have come to tell you everything. For six hours, Fuchs unpacks his double life like a suitcase full of sins. Yes, he gave atomic secrets to Sonia in 1942. Yes. He met Harry Gold in New Mexico. Yes, he handed over Fat Man's blueprints, even hydrogen bomb calculations. His voice stays clinical, almost detached until one moment. Sharing the plutonium bomb design, his voice cracks. That was the worst thing I've done. But then comes the question that matters. Why? Fuchs's answer chills the room. I wanted to prevent any one country from monopolizing such a terrible weapon. He genuinely believed he was saving the world by betraying it. Think about that psychology. In his mind, he's not a traitor. He's a guardian of balance, a reluctant hero preventing nuclear tyranny. Right or wrong, Klaus Fuchs slept soundly for seven years believing he'd saved humanity. March 1950, a British judge sentences him to 14 years the maximum for passing secrets to a wartime ally. Fuchs nods, accepting his fate like a mathematical proof. But as his cell door slams shut, his confession has already ignited a chain reaction. What happens when the FBI learns about Harry Gold? Who else was in this spy ring? How deep does the betrayal go? The moment Fuchs's confession reaches Washington, the FBI moves like unleashed hounds. They have a name, Harry Gold. In May 1950, 
Gold is arrested in Philadelphia. Confronted with Fuchs's testimony, he immediately cracks. But here's where it spirals. Gold names another accomplice, David Greenglass, an army machinist from Los Alamos. Greenglass caves instantly and points to his own brother-in-law, Julius Rosenberg. Suddenly, you're watching an entire spy ring collapse like dominoes. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are arrested by year's end. The American public demands blood. In 1953, both Rosenbergs will fry in the electric chair, the first American civilians executed for espionage. Think about that progression. One British physicist's confession leads to American citizens dying for treason. The atomic spy fever infects everything it touches, but the real devastation happens in Washington. January 31st, 1950, barely a week after Fuchs confesses, President Truman makes a fateful announcement. America will build the hydrogen bomb, a weapon that makes Fat Man look like a firecracker. The timing isn't coincidental. If the Soviets stole atomic secrets, they might steal H-bomb secrets too. America must stay ahead. The arms race shifts into overdrive. November 1952, America detonates Ivy Mike, a 10 megaton monster that erases an entire Pacific island. The Soviets respond with their own H-bomb by 1955. Within five years, both superpowers stockpile enough megatons to end human civilization multiple times over. The balance of terror Fuchs wanted, he got it, at doomsday scale. Meanwhile, paranoia consumes America. Fuchs's exposure fuels the Red Scare into an inferno. Careers destroyed on mere suspicion. Loyalty oaths become mandatory. Neighbors report neighbors. Senator Joe McCarthy waves his infamous list of communists in government just weeks after Fuchs's trial. The witch hunt begins. In Britain, the embarrassment cuts deep. How did they miss a Soviet spy in their most secret program? They quietly tighten security and share hard lessons with American allies. Trust no one, especially not the quiet ones. June 1959. After nine years behind bars, Klaus Fuchs walks free. He disappears into East Germany, spending his remaining years as a physicist behind the Iron Curtain. The West tries to forget him. But privately, intelligence officials still wonder about things because the ultimate irony is that Klaus Fuchs might have actually achieved his goal. The nuclear standoff he enabled lasted through the entire Cold War. The bombs never fell. The balance held. Humanity survived its own worst invention. Was that despite Klaus Fuchs or because of him? You decide. But before you go, 60 years later, another young man would face the same impossible choice. Stay silent and protect the system or expose the truth and become a traitor. If you think Klaus Fuchs shook the intelligence world, wait until you hear about the 29-year-old contractor who downloaded the NSA's darkest secrets and revealed them to the entire planet. That story about Edward Snowden and how one man outsmarted the world's most powerful surveillance machine is waiting for you right here.